I am Elle Penelope, author of Epic Fantasy and Paranormal Romance, and welcome to My Imaginary Friends, a look behind the scenes of an author mapping the worlds in my head and making them a reality. Hello friends, today is Sunday, September 19th, 2021, and this is episode 138 of My Imaginary Friends. I'm Leslie. So this week's best thing is that I turned in The Monsters We Defy, my story, um, my novel, the new book to my editor at Orbit, and it's a big relief, it's a big weight off my shoulders. Not that it was a weight, but turning in a book uh, is always wonderful. So this is the second time I've turned it in. It's the revision after the developmental edits, and I've been told I'm getting a line edit, which is new for me, and then it will go into copy edits, and then it will come out sometime (laughs) next summer, which is the tentative date. Don't you know, hold me to anything. I don't know. It hasn't been given an official date yet, but I will let you know as soon as I do know. So I did celebrate a little bit, but which means I got cheesecake. I ate too much cheesecake. I gave myself a stomach ache. I was celebrating so hard. I mean, it was just a big slice because I thought about, should I get a whole cheesecake? And then I was like, no, that is definitely not the best idea. So I just got a large slice and ate all of it when I should have eaten half of it and saved the other half for a celebration the next day. Instead, I ate all of it and I suffered for several hours. I've always found that old adage, uh, feast or famine, to be extremely accurate. Um, But things do generally tend to work out time-wise. So there was a period for the last couple months where I was working on this uh, revision and my day job, website development, was kind of slow, relatively slow, and it was wonderful, but it was also um, concerning because I knew that it being slow now means there's a deluge coming, and I am in the deluge work-wise and starting to come under a deluge writing-wise, which I will tell you about in a moment, but um, I think that I'm going to have to start meditating again because I'm starting to feel stressed and that sort of tightness in my chest and stomach that I actually have at this moment, because I was this morning on my mastermind uh, meeting, going over the things that I have to do this week and in the next few months, like basically for the rest of the year and then into next year. And I have to create a new schedule, um, create a new Gantt chart, which is my, my favorite way to do scheduling. But um, yeah, I'm definitely going to have to really manage my time very well and create good schedules and then also reincorporate the things that slip away when you're not as busy so like daily yoga daily meditation things that when i'm not super busy and stressed i don't have to do but i feel like i will have to do them so part of my final read through for the monsters we defy was putting it on my kindle and i just realized that i turned it in. I had some notes I made on my Kindle that I did not put into the document, but it's fine. I still have several other passes on this to go and other people will be looking at it, but I was just like, I was so excited to be done. I was like, oh, there was a couple chapters where I made some notes and I did not incorporate them. Anyway, what I was thinking about was that I moved some chapters around during the final read through. I realized, um, like when you're reading through it, you read through it for, to check things, to check the pacing and sort of the vibe of it. And it was really a pacing issue. It was the energy, I actually switched the order of a couple of scenes and then reorganized the chapters that they came in so that they just felt better so that you're ending a chapter in a way that you want to turn the page uh, and read the next chapter, but also the energy level. And that's kind of more of an intuitive thing. It's hard to describe, but there's there's movement in in certain scenes and sometimes you're ramping it up and sometimes you're slowing it down and you're trying to manage the reader's experience through the novel and so I just came to the end of a scene and the next scene the energy was just way different and it was just wrong and so I had to I switched the order of two scenes and then I tweaked the opening lines so that it just was a better transition from one chapter to the next one scene to the next And that was really interesting uh, because that's one of those things that I don't know that craft books deal with so much. Like, what is a chapter? You know, how do you divide your book into chapters? 
what is the difference? Like sometimes a chapter can end in the middle of a scene because you want that forward motion. You want sort of, if not a cliffhanger, at least that hook into the next one. So technically it's one scene, but you can just chop it in the middle and make it a chapter. And sometimes that doesn't work. I don't tend to do that. Usually I like to have the energy finish, you know, um, come to a resolution of the conflict of the scene. And then we move into the next scene and that can also that can also often be a good chapter break. So that last pass was, um, you know, checking for errors to continuity, making sure the changes I made were right, and also feeling the energy and the pacing of the book and trying to make sure that it, it flowed really well. There's a musicality to text and language and to the movement of scenes and chapters. So the big picture musicality of a novel and the small detail, you know, note to note musicality of it, which is word choice and um, you know, reading sentences out loud and see how they flow. Usually I will have the, the computer read the book back to me, but I think I'll, I'm going to do that at the line edit stage and see how that works. So yeah, those are just <laughs> some of the things that I do before I turn a book in at different stages. So what has me needing to meditate more? Um, I don't know exactly when the line edits will come on this, but that's a much shorter process if it's anything like reviewing copy edits um although that's going to come too all this by the end of the year i'm sure if this book is coming out uh, late next summer i did get my edits back on savage city which is the paranormal romance that i'm planning to self-publish sometime in early next year and there are a lot of notes from my editor i'd also had feedback from beta readers which i've been looking into and I think I'll talk about that a little bit later. So got the edits back for Savage City. The cover is in progress. I'm very excited about that too. I got notes back on um, this 1830s project that I'm doing that is more of a collaborative thing. So I've had to get a lot of sign off on the synopsis and finally got that. So the next step for that is to write the book proposal. Having turned in book one for Orbit, I do have a two book deal. And at the moment, book two is due next June. And I have not started it. And so thinking about that, I have the kernel of an idea, but I definitely need to spend time and energy flushing that out, creating a synopsis, running it by my editor to see if she likes the idea. And if she doesn't, then coming up with something else, um, which is I didn't want to even focus too much on that before I turned the book in. So that's three projects. And... um, Thinking about timelines, you know, there's flexibility with, of course, my self-published published project. My only um, hard date is that I have to, I can't publish within three months of my Orbit book. So assuming, you know, that comes out as of now, they say August, you know, we'll see. But that gives me hard deadlines for, okay, if I'm publishing it next year, it has to be by May, which, I mean, it's September right now, so that's not an issue. But if I want to do the audiobook simultaneously, I need at least three months for that. Um, I need to get it ready to get a synopsis to my agent to see if we can sell the audiobook rights. If we don't, I'll do it myself, but I still need at least three months, I'm sure. So those dates are affect my schedule. This book proposal... It's like, okay, well, when are we going to go on submission with it? Well, the end of the year is not a good time to go on submission with a book. Generally, like December, no. I'm pretty sure that nobody nobody goes on submission in December. November is also kind of iffy. So that's something I was talking to my agent about, like how fast should I pace myself to do this? Should I, should I try to push it out? Like the fastest I could possibly get this proposal out would be the end of October. That puts submission in November. So why don't I just take the extra time and just finish it by the end of the year so that it can be on submission in January, which is probably maybe even February, you know, a a better time. Um, So juggling those issues, then also looking at this this, this second Orbit book, and I know it's early enough that I can push the date, you know, pretty easily if needed. Like the earlier you push a date, the better. And I feel like, you know, writing this book by June, depending on if this idea I have, if my editor likes it. On top of everything else, it might be a stretch. Um, 
Also, the Kickstarter funded for the Time Travelers, the three Time Travelers walk into a dot 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 anthology. So there's a short story that I have to write by December, but it's only 5,000 words. I'm not worried about that at all, but I do have to start like plotting it, <laughs> thinking about what it is. And part of that process is, um, you know, so plotting two things, um, working on a revision for one thing and then a fast draft of another thing. They're all in different stages, which is really good because that helps me be able to work on more than one thing at a time. Um, but when I'm considering plotting something new, a lot of that is about filling the well and finding inspiration wherever I am. So I, I've i been consuming a little bit more media than usual. Um, we, when I was in Denver last week, I was watching the Netflix series um, How to Be a Tyrant, which I added to my queue months ago, and it was really interesting. I highly recommend it. I don't know if I talked about it before. My memory goes when I'm stressed, so it's even worse than normal, which normally my memory is terrible. So I apologize if there's lots of repetition. <laughs> but How to Be a Tyrant was uh, very clever, very interesting. I had, you know, done research on tyrants when I was writing The True Father in the Earthsinger Chronicles, and uh, it was just more reinforcement, like even more details that I was like, oh, I could have put that in, I could have added that, you know, for the world building. I don't know if I'm writing a tyrant anytime soon, um, but that kind of thing is always interesting to me. I have been listening to a, a podcast, The Fall of Civilizations podcast, which is wonderful. It's fascinating. Uh, I feel like, and he hasn't stated this outright, the host of the podcast, but it's sort of like, hey, America, and maybe even Great Britain, because it's a British host. This is how empires fall. Like, look at these things that have happened before. I'm seeing a lot of those things happening to you guys now, so watch out. Um, so it, yeah, really interesting podcast. They're long episodes. I've gotten through the first four or five. The last one was on the Khmer Empire in Cambodia. Um, there was one on the Vikings in Greenland, uh, the Mayan Collapse, the Bronze Age, and Roman Britain. So the, the first five episodes uh, all super good. And I've queued up the next one. Uh, so there's only 13. It takes them a long time to, you know, it's not like a super regular podcast because they're long and they're really well researched and detailed and really, really interesting. So all kinds of interesting things. Not for any, I don't know, you know, you never know when things that you input are going to come out. But I do have a Fall of Empire story. It's actually the Earth Singer, the Earth Singer prequel, the super far in the past thousands of years before the books that are published prequel that I did for NaNoWriMo years ago and have not looked at in years. But one day I do want to write it. One day I want to get back to epic fantasy. And maybe that's like a 2023 type of situation. <laughs> but anyway, it's going into the vaults, going to the, to the database, and it's being cataloged. So part of plotting for me is just sort of watching things, reading things, finding gems, because I did a podcast episode at some point in the past, just talking about like when you're ready to have inspiration come, it comes. That's how that's what I found to be true. And so everything becomes like the universe is trying to help you is what I think that episode was called. And I do feel like when I'm in a receptive mode, when I'm ready to receive inspiration, creativity, ideas, um, I do have to give myself time and space to receive them and they come. So my stress level isn't that I don't think I can do everything. It's that how do I manage my time and my energy and my health to be able to do everything in the time allotted? Because I can't sit in front of the computer all day. Um, you know, my wrists have been really good for a while, even with that long climb uh, last week. I didn't have any pain. I just had the soreness. But I, you know, I, d I do have wrist issues. I have this elbow ulnar nerve thing going on, which really is um, one of the main reasons I can't sit at this computer all day and type and work. So... Like, and by all day, I mean like more than eight hours. You know, I really have to be careful. Pacing myself is going to be very important. I did want to talk about editorial feedback because I got their notes back for Savage City. 
which right now is like a 70,000-ish word paranormal romance. It's probably going to get a little longer when I do the revision. And I worked with my uh, longtime freelance editor, who I've been working with since the self-published version of Song of Blood and Stone for developmental edits. And I'd also gotten several beta readers to read the book. And so the beta reader feedback was pretty different than the editorial feedback that I got. I feel like and, and this, there might be different reasons for that. I mean, I can't know what's in other people's minds, but I had, I think, five people, five beta readers, including one of my longtime critique partners who, um, you know, had really constructive, helpful feedback, all of them. But overall, the tone was very positive. Like, I felt like they liked it. And there's definitely, obviously, things that I can improve and work on. My editor, I felt like she didn't like it that much. Like she had a lot, a lot of feedback and a lot of things to say. And of course, that's why we get edits. Um, but I did want to talk about when edits don't feel right to you. And and I'm going to have to go back through what she sent and really with a fine tooth comb and evaluate everything and and make a list of what I'm going to change and what and, and not. I'm not going to make a list of what I'm not going to change, but just be okay putting aside uh, things that she has said that I don't necessarily agree with or just don't resonate with me. You know, whenever you're getting editorial feedback, whether it's someone you paid as a freelance editor or an acquiring editor at a traditional house, it is up to you, the author, to um, figure out if it matches up with your intent and if it resonates, if it feels right for the story. You can get a lot of feedback, um, even from beta readers and, and, you know, other people who are not like professionals, but who are readers and have have responses and reactions to your work. You can get feedback that just doesn't feel right. And you have to honor that and respect that. And so, yeah, I'm feeling like there were a lot of differences and, and not just that, oh, she didn't like it and I don't want to change it, because that is a thing that can be um, pride it can be like, no, I trust myself enough that I know what I was trying to do and it worked for these people and it didn't work for these people and that's okay because you're never going to please everyone. But you really have to evaluate every bit of feedback and, and learning what to take and what to discard is a skill, you know. Um, I do think there's a value even in the things that you choose not to change because I know if these things I choose not to change other people will probably have the same reaction that she did to it and I have to be okay with that if it just doesn't feel like it's going to improve the story or if it's going to take you in a direction that you weren't going um, maybe I don't change that thing but I look at okay why is she feeling this way and what is the core of the problem and is that something that I need to address like if if she says you know, I don't understand why the character would do that. Then, okay, look at, okay, have you explained well enough in the text why they're doing that? Have you shown um, through backstory, through emotions, through deep POV, there's a number of ways to show the characters uh, coming to a, a decision or, you know, doing an action. Maybe something there needs work and you can tighten that up and then someone else might not have that reaction. But... Um, so yeah, sometimes the feedback is they say a thing that either doesn't work for them or is it maybe a suggestion for a change and that thing doesn't resonate, but there is an issue and you can choose to find the actual root cause of the issue or ignore the issue and be like, well, it's working for me. I like it. I don't want to change it. Move on. Those are options, you know, so evaluating it is a thing that has to be done. Uh, comparing feedback is a thing that has to be done. And also realizing that no book is perfect. You know, I was reading several books. I, I For a long time, I wasn't reading. And then I, I read a couple of like short self-published books that were easy to digest. And, you know, like one of them, I was thinking like, I'm enjoying this. Like it has problems. Like if I was the editor, I would make some suggestions here. But as a reader, I read through it. I I did end up enjoying it. It did its job for me. And um, that was good enough. So like, okay, what is my goal here? Like, I'm not trying to win a Hugo Award off of this book. Like, 
that's not the purpose, that's not the style, that's not the anything. I want to write an entertaining book that is going to, um, that someone hopefully will like. So yes, I could follow all of these suggestions and, you know, at, at the same time, like I do want the book to be the best it can be. Like I'm asking someone to pay money and spend the time on this. And for me, it's like a respect thing. It's like, I'm not going to put out anything but my best work. So like balancing that with like how good it has to be, which is always that art versus business kind of thing. Like, okay, if it's it's good enough right now for many people, like even without editing it, like I, I could put the book out right now and people could read it and it would be on par or better than a lot of other things that are in the marketplace. It's not good enough for me yet. And then what is good enough for me? I could spend another year on this book and make it like amazing and wonderful. Possibly, I don't know if a year would even do that. <laughs> but you know, like there's a thinking. And I could spend another two months on it and bring it up to a higher level than it is today and put it out. And uh, like, I don't have a year to spend on anything. So, and like I said, I don't even know that all of that time is even really necessary, you know? Because honestly, when I got the feedback from my editor, I was like, oh God, <laughs> she did not like this at all. Um, should I even put this book out? Like that literally, th like, I remember really feeling good about this when I finished that draft, knowing it needed an edit, it needed at least another revision pass, but feeling good about it. And then you get like a lot of feedback that kind of makes you question your sense of what is good and not and I've seen this happen to lots of other people and I've seen people get edits back and put the book away and not even be able to deal with it for a long time if ever again which is really sad but it's understandable you know you do have to have a thick skin I I, I do have a thick skin and you know there but there was that moment when I was like I maybe this book is terrible maybe I've just done a terrible terrible job and like I don't know what's good anymore um and then, you know, took another breath and was like, no, I have enough books out. I've been doing this long enough that I do trust myself. And that is one of the most important things as a writer that you need is trust in yourself. I do trust myself. I do know that, that I can evaluate whether something is up to par or not. So I need to take a step back away from this and in a couple days, a week, maybe more. So I printed everything out and I'm like, I'm going to look at this later. And I'm going to look at all the feedback I've gotten from the beta readers and from my editor. And maybe next week, maybe not, maybe this week. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, and then come up with a plan. You know, I, I, I remember feeling good about this. I love this story. I've been working on it for a long time. I can, I can bring this up to a level that I will be happy with. And that I think that will make my readers happy and give them a book that is enjoyable. And that is my goal. So yeah, um, dealing with, with edits and feedback in general, critiques, is difficult. You know, it is not easy. And I think it should cause you to question yourself. But I think that after you question yourself, you come up with the answers. And then you go back to trusting yourself which is much harder to do when you're brand new and you don't have that confidence. We all doubt ourselves. We all doubt our judgment. Having good judgment is really important. I think Courtney Milan said this, that the most important thing to have if you want to self-publish is good judgment. You have to judge whether your book is ready, whether the cover is good, you know, the blurb, the title, every aspect of it. You need good judgment in order to not put out trash. And I know that I don't put out trash, but yeah, it's, it's, you can get some feedback that really makes you question everything. And like I said, it's not a bad thing, but you have to come out on the other side with answers that make you comfortable and, um, that you can live with. It brings to mind, um, a conversation I had yesterday for author Andy Jones. She is putting out a a book on self-care, like a workbook. And so she's, she was doing a series of interviews. I will definitely let you know when they are posted and public. But it was a really good conversation about resilience that I had yesterday. And it got me thinking about resilience a lot. Um, I, I think that it is an important quality. It is vital. It can be abused if you're not careful. 
and we talk about that. And so part of resilience is flexibility, agility, adaptability. You know, I made an analogy about a a rubber band. Being resilient, you know, you have to stretch and then sometimes you have to contract and you have to be, be sure that you're not stretching so much that you break because you can break a rubber band. It's got a lot of capacity, but it has a maximum. And then hopefully it can retake its original shape. But sometimes you do you see the old ones that are stretched and then they become brittle. And something I didn't think about till today is, you know, you hear a lot about fragility these days. Often it's termed like white fragility, but if you just think about well, where does that even come from? The fragility is like the opposite of resilience. Fragility and brittleness, um, not being able to adapt, not being able to stretch and whether it's being inclusive, you know, a rubber band is inclusive. It holds all these things together, whatever you're banding together. Um, but it can hold too much and it can break. And so that's the other end of the spectrum. And so with this, all of these projects that I'm dealing with and um, like scheduling and planning and feeling stressed, it's really making sure that I stretch as far, not even as far as I can, but stretch to a, a level that is not going to break, which is burnout, you know, and I've, I've felt burnout before uh, a couple of times in my life and it's not fun. And I need to say no to more things. I'm bad at that because I want to do all these things and they're interesting to me and you never know what can happen. I mean, so many things that I do yield results that I never would have anticipated and yield opportunities. And those are good, but nothing works if I snap. And I feel like I'm rambling. I, I, it connects in my mind. I don't know if I've, if I've made the connection. I did not get a ton of sleep two nights ago. Cheesecake incident. So I will, I do have some Q&A and I wanted to answer some of these questions before I go. If you have a question for me, um, email me at podcast at lpenelope.com if you would like me to answer the question on the show. This question is, do you have any thoughts on fan fiction? I don't read a lot of fan fiction and I've never written fan fiction. Somehow I missed that when everybody else got into it. I think I was in grad school and I was working full time and I don't know, I missed it. But I mean, and I know some people are very passionate about it. I know tons of writers got their start writing fan fiction and then becoming published authors. So I think it's great. I mean, I do get inspired by existing things and they spark creativity. So um, I'm all for fan fiction. I just, I, I've, I've maybe read one or two stories, but not a lot. So I don't have a lot of knowledge about it. And then how long does it take to come up with a title for your podcast episodes or on a larger scale, your novels and stories? Podcast episodes, um, it's kind of the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> like I, I try to make my podcast production like two hours from start to finish, sometimes two and a half. So the recording, editing, making the graphics, posting it up, making the show notes, everything, which means as soon as I stop recording or sometimes I record and then edit on a different day. But um, by the time I finish editing, I'm like thinking about the titles and hopefully it, the idea is for it to relate to what I was talking about. I definitely could do a better job. And sometimes it's just like, oh, that's a cool title. It just popped into my head and I'll use that. Sometimes I do change it um, when I'm making the graphic. I'm like, eh, I don't know about that. But I, it's very quick. It's a very quick process. I, I try to just go with my gut and not overthink it so that I don't spend too much time on it. Because if I spent too much time on it, I wouldn't do it at all. As far as my novels and stories, sometimes the, the title comes to me immediately. And um, like with Song of Blood and Stone, not immediate. I brainstormed over a hundred titles. I had lists on lists on lists before I came up with Song of Blood and Stone. And then the other ones were just a matter of making lists of like nouns and sound words and making sure that they fit the story in some way. Um, so it's sound word of object and object or concept and concept. And that is, I just had lots of lists and I, I wanted the sound words, you know, song, whispers, cry, 
um, I still wanted to relate to the book, but those took a while. The first one, the second, the, the next one's not, not nearly as long. I didn't brainstorm hundreds of things, but, um, I came up with a bunch of different titles and then chose the ones that worked for those particular books or stories. And, um, something like The Monsters We Defy, it was, it comes from a poem by Claude McKay. And I had wanted, I was like, hmm, I love this title. I love, I don't even know when it came about. You know, I, I'd been doing the research on Harlem Renaissance figures and reading poetry. And I came across that one. The poem is, uh, If We Must Die. And I think it, I think it was written in response to the 1919 riots or just, maybe it was just in response to lynching and black death and terrorism against black people in general. But since, you know, my character in that book, um, is a real character from the 1919 riots, it just stuck out to me. And then I was like, well, it doesn't really, like, there's no monsters, there's no literal monsters in the book, but the poem is not about literal monsters either. So it fit, it spoke to me, it, it felt right in my spirit. And I fought it for a while and I had titled it something else originally. And then I was like, no, I really, I'm going back to this title that I really wanted. And, you know, if they don't want it, they can change it. Publishing companies change titles all the time. So far, knock on wood, I've been very lucky. They, no one's ever changed any of my titles. I've picked every title of my traditionally published work. Um, so yeah, if they don't come very easily, they come very hard. <laughs> that is the short answer to the question. So goals for this coming week. We just did goals in Mastermind, and I, I kind of just like was like, ha, ha, I don't know. My goals are to make my goals, to figure out what I'm doing for the rest of the year. My schedule, the order of it, I have to list everything. I have to do a brain dump because it's weighing heavily on me, not being able to look at everything I have to do, like work, home, writing. Those are my three buckets. And I have this, um, I bought this pad from Ink and Vault which is like a planning papery printing company. I don't know what you'd call it, but it's a pad of pre-printed pages that um, like a weekly brain dump. And that's what I'm using it for because I have my, my planner, my weekly daily planner, but in it, there's not really a place for me to list out everything on one piece of paper. And that's what I need. So I, I'll link to that in show notes if anyone is interested, but it's got like gold foil. It's very pretty. It's very nice. And I just, it gives enough columns so that I can bucket everything that's on my mind from like make eye doctor appointment to plot out this story and look at it and then bring it into my project management system, figure out what day I'm doing things, like do my whole project management thing that I do. And that will make me feel a lot better once I get some more stuff planned out and scheduled. I will feel like I'm in control of it, even though there's many different ways that it can blow up and will blow up. Like the schedule is not going to be the schedule, but exerting what little control I can and then letting the universe do what it does will still make me feel better. So those are my goals. I have the Hampton Roads Writers Conference this week. I am a keynote speaker. I have not finished writing my keynote speech. <laughs> I also have two workshops that I have to plan because I'm doing four and I the two of them are normal ones that I do regularly and two of them are, are newish for me. So I have a lot going on this week. I'm going to take a nap after I finish, <laughs> finish this podcast. I hope that you have a wonderful week and I will talk to you next week. For episode show notes and to watch the video episodes on YouTube, go to myimaginaryfriendsshow.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And I would really appreciate a rating and review to help support the show. My Imaginary Friends is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. For more fantastic podcasts, go to frolic.media slash podcast.